Welcome back to the Poker Math series. In part one, we explored hand distribution, the full pyramid of 1,326 possible starting hands, and saw how often different types of hands really appear in Texas Hold'em. We broke down how straights form and why connectors make up a huge part of playable poker math. I'm Terry Wood, and in this video, we're shifting focus from lines to suits, from straight draws to flush draws, and exploring what happens when the two overlap. Because understanding suited connectors isn't just about chasing pretty hands, it's about knowing the real math behind flush odds, combo draw equity, and how suited hands gain value over time. This is where probability meets profit, and where poker math starts to shape real decision making. Before we dive into flushes, let's take one quick look back at the hand pyramid and poker math pie chart from part one. Out of every 1,326 possible starting hands in Texas Hold'em, about 24% are suited, roughly one in four hands dealt. But only 14% are suited connectors, the kind that can make both a straight and a flush. The rest, hands like King-3 suited or Queen-5 suited, can make a flush, yes, but rarely a straight. Some players justify playing these for their high card value, in addition to their suitedness. A word of warning here, even if you hit your king or queen, you may well have top pair, but you also have no kicker. How many times have you heard someone say, or said yourself, at showdown, I might have kicker problems? Might? There's rarely a might. Before you enter the pot is the time to think about kicker problems, not after the chips are in the middle. Suited connectors hold a marginal mathematical advantage. They don't just give you a chance at a flush, they add secondary paths to win, provided you are playing the right combinations. In poker math, that's called combination equity, multiple, independent ways to make a winning hand. And that's what separates playable suited hands from the ones that just look pretty. Now let's look at the math behind flushes and clear up one of the most common misunderstandings in poker. Whether you're holding ace-2 suited or 9-6 suited, your chance of flopping a made flush is only about 0.8%, roughly 118 to 1 odds. You'll flop a flush draw, that is, two of your suit on the flop, about 10% of the time, or roughly once every 10 hands with suited cards. And if you do flop that draw, you'll complete the flush by the river about 35% of the time. From pre-flop to river, that all adds up to a total probability of roughly 6.5%, or about 14 to 1 odds of making a flush. And here's the key, those numbers don't change. The probability of hitting a flush is identical across all suited hands. What changes is everything around that probability, your position, stack size, opponent tendencies, and how well your hand plays when the flush doesn't come in. Being suited adds some value, but it doesn't make a bad hand good. Statistically, being suited adds only about a 2 to 3% edge over the same hand off suit. That's it. Suitedness isn't a magical fix for a ragged hand. Yet players chase anything with matching symbols, as if it were a golden ticket to the winner's circle. Sometimes, though, suitedness can be a legitimate decision maker. Let's say you're in middle position, facing a preflop raise that's five times the big blind from a tight player who only opens with aces, kings, queens, or ace king. You look down at ace jack suited. Against that range, you're behind, but being suited gives you just enough extra equity to make it a closer call. I'm not saying you should call. I'm saying it's one of those borderline spots where suitedness can legitimately tip the scale. Suitedness doesn't make a weak hand strong, but in the right conditions, it can be the deciding factor between folding and continuing. A quick reminder, suitedness is a bonus, not a strategy. It creates additional potential, albeit marginal and situational. Before we look at combo draws, let's take a quick look at what the board actually gives us. The flop will contain two of one suit and one of another about 55% of the time. About 5% of the time, you'll see a flop that's three of the same suit. And about 40% of the time, it'll come rainbow, three different suits. So, just over half the time, the board will show some flush potential, and that's when players start to get creative with what they call combo draws. A combo draw is simply any hand that has multiple ways to win, like a straight draw and a flush draw at the same time. A classic example is the 8 of spades and the 7 of spades on a 9 of spades, 6 of clubs, and 2 of spades flop. You've got an open-ended straight draw and the flush draw. At first, it appears you would have 17 outs, 8 for the open-ended straight draw and 9 for the flush. While that is accurate, two of those outs, in this case the 5 of spades and the 10 of spades, overlap, as either one will complete both the flush and the straight. To avoid counting the 5 and 10 twice, we must deduct those two from the total, leaving us with 15 outs, 
or approximately a 54% probability, or 0.85 to 1 odds, of completing either the flush or the straight by the river. Now, let's break this hand down by the turn and river. For the turn, we have about a 32% probability, or 2.13 to 1 odds, of completing either the straight or the flush. If we miss the turn, we have about a 33% probability, or 2.07 to 1 odds, of completing the hand on the river. As you can see, there is almost an immeasurable variance between the turn and river probabilities. But here's the part most players miss. Not every combo draw is created equal. When you're holding suited gapped cards, your straight and flush draws overlap less often, you have fewer shared outs, and your true equity drops. Let's break it down by connector type. Let's start with true suited connectors, hands like Jack-10 or 10-9. With no gaps, these hands have the maximum number of straight combinations for possible ways to complete a straight, plus the flush potential. Pre-flop to river, that gives you about a 15% probability, or roughly 5.67 to 1 odds, of making either a straight or a flush by showdown. This is the best category. Your draws overlap efficiently, and your equity is at its highest. Next are the one-gap suited hands. Hands like 8-6 or 9-7 the gap removes one straight combination, leaving three possible ways to make a straight and slightly lowering your overall probability. These hands still maintain strong drawing potential, about 15% probability, or 5.67 to 1 odds, of completing a straight or flush by the river. In the middle one gappers are playable, and the difference in expected value is nearly immeasurable when compared to in the middle no gap connectors. However, when you move nearer the ends in the one gap category, your equity quickly declines when compared to no gap connectors. With two gap suited hands, like 9 6 or 8 5, you lose another entire straight combination, leaving you only two ways to make a straight. Now you're down to roughly a 13% probability, or 6.69 to 1 odds, of completing either draw. The flush chance remains constant, but your straight equity keeps shrinking, and that's where many players overestimate their combo draws. The gaps don't just affect the straight, they reduce your total combo strength. Finally, we have suited three gap hands like Jack-7 or 8-4. Here, the straight component is at its weakest, with only one path to a straight. Your overall probability of hitting a straight or flush drops to around 11%, or about 8.09 to 1 odds. These hands might look playable because they're suited, but the math says otherwise, you've lost three straight combinations, and all that remains is the flat flush percentage. So while suitedness stays constant, your straight potential decays with every gap you add. That's why not all combo draws are created equal. The more gaps you introduce, the less your hand can capitalize on both forms of equity. And it's not just about gaps, where your cards sit in the rank structure matters too. Connectors in the middle, like 8-7 or 9-8, can form straights in both directions, while hands near the edges, like Ace-King or Ace-Deuce, can only connect one way. The closer you get to the ends of the sequence, the fewer total combinations exist, and the lower your true probability of hitting. And then there's the big illusion, backdoor draws. You'll hear this all the time on TV commentary. They've got backdoor straight and flush possibilities, as if that somehow means something. The reality? A backdoor flush draw, that's one card of your suit on the flop and two needed, completes only about 4% of the time. 96% of the time, it goes nowhere. Sure, in solver outputs and GTO theory, backdoor draws have value because they're part of balanced ranges, they help justify certain semi-bluffs. But in live poker, that equity is statistical noise. It doesn't exist in any meaningful way until you see a second card of your suit. So when a commentator says he's got backdoor possibilities, remember, it's TV. They've got airtime to fill. You don't have chips to waste. Combo draws are real. Backdoor draws are mostly fantasy. And learning the difference between them will save you a lot of small pots and a few big ones. Now that we've covered the math, let's bring it back to real game decision making, where theory meets the table. The first thing to understand is that not all flush draws are created equal. Let's take the low end seated hands, hands like the 7 4 of spades or the 9 6 of hearts. Sure, they're suited, but they're also bottom heavy. Here's the danger. About one third of the time, another player at the table will also be holding two cards of your suit, and at least one of them will almost always be higher in rank. That means even when you do make your flush, it's potentially the second best hand. And second best flushes are the silent bankroll killers. They win small pots and lose big ones. When your flush isn't to the ace or king, or sometimes queen, depending on board texture and the action level, it's a hand that looks strong but plays weak. 
That's the wrong side of the math. Now, about ace x suited. If a flush completes, ace x suited gives you the nut flush. That part's safe. The real leak happens the 90% of the time you miss the flush draw on the flop and keep playing. You pair your ace and suddenly face kicker problems against stronger aces like ace-king, ace-queen, or ace-jack. In a full nine-handed game, even when you hold an ace, there's still roughly a 70% probability that someone else also has won. So that so-called ace blocker doesn't protect you from opponents already holding an ace. It only reduces the probability that an ace hits the board. The key takeaway is this. Flush potential adds opportunity, but it doesn't erase risk. Strong players evaluate suited hands through reverse implied odds, not just how much they can win, but how much they stand to lose when they're second best. That's why disciplined players fold weak suited connectors pre-flop. Not because they dislike suited cards, but because the math doesn't support the chase. So, what should we take away from all this? First, flushes and straight combos are beautiful hands on paper, but they're still governed by math, not magic. The odds don't change because the cards look pretty. About 1 in 10 times you'll flop a flush draw. About 1 in 15 you'll make the flush by the river. The rest of the time, you're chasing. Second, understand where your value comes from. Middle and high suited connectors, hands like ace-king suited and king-queen suited have structure, board coverage, and fold equity. Low end suited hands don't. They trap you in reverse implied odd spots and get you paid off small while potentially costing you big. Third, context is everything. A flush draw with position and aggression behind it is a weapon. The same hand out of position can often become a liability. And finally, remember this. Poker isn't about rules. It's about tools. The math doesn't tell you what to do. It tells you what's possible. Your discipline decides what's profitable. So the next time you look down at two matching cards, pause and ask yourself, is this hand structured to win or designed to deceive me? If you haven't seen part one of our poker math series on hand distribution and straight draws, I recommend starting there to see how these probabilities connect from pre-flop to river. I have placed the link in the description below. If you think this video has value, please like, share, and subscribe. Thanks for watching. I'm Terry Wood from PokerAlber.com, and we'll see you at the tables.